Hi, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking to you about aplastic anemia. So I'm going to say what is aplastic anemia? Um, it's going to be a bit of a heavy one because um, obviously it's a bit close to my heart. But it's something that I feel that people need to know about. That Because I know when, when my daughter got ill I struggled with what is aplastic anemia and doctors don't really explain it to you the internet scares the living daylights out of you so um, I thought I'd just tell you, give you a little bit of insight about what we went through and what Alexis went through so that you can sort of know if your child's just been diagnosed with that what you will be looking at and what you're going to be sort of going through obviously each child is different but um, this should just help you understand a little bit more and um, just be aware of things. So I hope that it's going to help you and that you're going to enjoy the video or not really enjoy it because I suppose it's not a subject that you would enjoy but just that it's going to be helpful for you. So what is aplastic anemia? So I'm just going to give you like a little bit of the medical version of it. So first of all, blood cells normally die. I mean, um, I don't know if you knew that, but that's just a normal thing. Blood cells normally die. In fact, red blood cells live for about 120 days. And white blood cells actually usually only live for a day or even less than a day. And platelets live for about six days. So that means that your bone marrow is producing um, or making blood, new blood cells constantly. And um, that's... I mean, it's actually quite amazing that that's your body is busy doing that all the time. Now, with aplastic anemia, um, the normal production of all the different blood cells, like red and white blood cells and your platelets, it slows down or it completely stops. This is because the stem cells in your bone marrow have been damaged. Now, the cause of the damage is mostly unknown. They don't really know why. I could give you the whole medical version of this, but you could probably just find it on the many medical journals that are in the, on the internet. And also, some of those things you actually need your PhD to understand, which is why I went looking to understand, like, what is this all about? And um, I had people that came and saw me from different um, institutions that also helped me to understand it. So I'm just going to basically give you the Undine version of it so that um, you can see like what research, that, what did I find out with the research that I did um, when my youngest child got ill with the illness. So first of all, they told me that only one in a million children get it. And they told me this as if to make me feel better. <laughs> and I was like, um, why would I make, why would that make me feel better? My child is the one in the million that got it. It's not going to make me feel better. It doesn't make me feel like she's special because of that, even though she was special. But that is not something that's going to make me feel better. In fact, you ask questions like, why? Why would it be her, you know? So, yeah, just so you know, that's what they tell you. Um, I don't know now with, with um, pollution being where it is at the moment. Maybe it's worse now. But when she got it, they told me it was one in a million. They also said that she could have gotten it from pollution, the bad air pollution clashing with her body um, because we were living in springs and apparently it was um, the air pollution is very bad because it's surrounded by um, burning factories and all of that. So they said it could have been because of that or it could have been hereditary. Now I can tell you and I'm pretty sure you'd understand it is maddening when you don't have something to blame. Because then what inevitably happens is you blame yourself and don't do it. Don't blame yourself because you couldn't have stopped it either way. So just don't do it. Don't blame yourself. Because it's not, it's not going to be a productive use of your time. So what I did and what I can tell you is a good idea is I kept like a journal of her journey through the illness. So this is the book that I got that I did. It's just a normal A4 hardcover. I think it's 288 page or 192 page, whichever book. Um, it says Alexis's journey through aplastic anemia. <laughs> no, just 
a little journal and in this journal or in this book basically I wrote everything down that happened to her in her life and then also what happened in the hospital I wrote down her blood counts her medical reports questions that I had for the doctor um, for the doctors and then the answers to the questions um, I also had lists of all the doctors that she saw because when she was in Donald Gordon Medical Center there it's a lot of different doctors because they come from all different places um, so sometimes she would see a different doctor each time and then also what was done on each visit that she went to the hospital so whether it was platelets or if it's blood and platelets or um, whichever so this helped me to keep record of um, everything that was happening so that I didn't get lost in all the hospital visits because you, you can tend to get lost and it just helped me, I, I don't know how to say it, but it just, it helped me to keep perspective and to just stay calm um, because I'm an organized person, it helped me to stay sort of organized in, the, in, a, in a, a situation where I had no control so it's it just helped me a lot to keep that in so i can tell you it helps if you're an organized person do that keep a journal of everything that's happening because then you won't feel like you're getting lost and you will know what's happening and what needs to happen and why they're stressing out about something because if you look back you'll see what happened you know so it just helps you to know what's going on so what i can tell you is i asked someone not the doctors because they didn't answer me but um i asked someone to tell me what the blood counts should look like in a normal person so if they do a blood count on a normal person that is healthy what should the blood count look like so that when i get her blood count back i will know if it's bad or not so they are as follows um the white blood cell count should be between 6 and 18 the hemoglobin, which is the red blood cell count, that should be between 10.8 and 14.2. Um, the platelets, they are supposed to be between 180 and 440. And then the neutrophils, they should be between 26 and 52. Now, neutrophils are what fight infection in your blood. And I can tell you, they don't test for this every time. So you like on my list, you'll sometimes see there's a little line where there was no result because they didn't test for it. But um, just so that you do know when they do test for it, what it is. Now, I'm going to give you the shortened version of what aplastic anemia is. That I, the vision that I used to tell people when they used to ask me um, just after she passed away. So it became almost like a mantra. Like, what is aplastic anemia? And um, I can tell you the shortened version. Um, so it's when your bone marrow doesn't produce platelets, and platelets is what your body needs to be able to stop you from bleeding. So if you hurt yourself, you could bleed to death. And that's the gist of what aplastic anemia is. So when you when you get a bruise or when you get a um, when you a scab, that is your platelets that's busy working to get you to stop bleeding. Now with aplastic anemia, they don't have that. In fact, it almost never scabs over. It just basically eventually stops bleeding <laughs> i don't even know how to tell you it's like almost that's why you, you had to always watch that they don't cut themselves um and then bruising is basically internal bleeding which is not nice to think you you don't think of a bruise like that but that is actually what it is um i can tell you alexis got sick when she was three years old uh what I, what happened was i actually took her to the gp because she had a very bad bruise on her leg. I mean, you can imagine three, the bruise was about, like if I look at her leg, it was about that size on her leg. And she also had a cold, and then she had these funny dots on her leg, which um, I thought was weird. So I took her to the doctor. He looked at, he took one look at her legs, and he sent her for blood tests immediately. He just said, he, he didn't even look any further. He didn't even look at the cold. He just said blood tests. So um, because of all those, apparently what was upsetting him was the, all the little blood spots that were all over her legs. It looked like little pinpricks that were creating blood um, all over her, everywhere, not just her legs. She was covered in them. 
So when I went for the blood test, when we went there, they did a bleeding time test. So you'll see it's like a little blade in a little thing that comes out and like pricks her almost, but it's like a cutting thing. Um, they said to me that usually you, you should stop bleeding after a maximum of nine minutes. You shouldn't bleed more than nine minutes. They cut her time off at like 15.54 minutes. And I noticed that she still bled for two hours after that. So that meant her platelets were not working. Um, now, I can tell you this is something where, like a parent tip for you. Or a pro tip. Not pro tip, but like a experience tip. Is that if you are, as a parent, this is something you're going to need to prepare yourself for. When, when they just start out on this journey. Because your child will be pleading with you to not let them use them as a pincushion, basically. They're going to be pleading with you. And this will hurt your soul. Um, so you need to try and prepare for this because it's, it's not a nice experience to go through where they are begging you to not let the doctors hurt them. So prepare yourself for that. It is also important that you have a good support system to hold you up under the pressure. Your parents, your family, sisters, brothers, cousins, whoever, whoever is your support system. It's important that you have people. And if you're a single parent, your family, you need your family. And if you don't have, then you need to find people that can help you. People that can, your friends, you know, friends are also our chosen family. So... You just need people. You cannot do it alone. Do not do it alone. You will not make it as a parent. You, It's just too much for you to handle. So you need people. Church people, whoever. Just You need people around you to help you. So, um, okay, the main medication that Alexis was put on was called cyclosporin, which I had to give to her in a syringe. It wasn't as much. It was like a little bit every day. Um, I think twice a day actually, if I can remember correctly, but that is the medicine's name that she was on. And then she would need to stay in hospital, especially in the beginning, sometimes a month at a time. And then I would stay with her. And one of the nice things about Donald Gordon Medical Center is that you can actually, um, and also the medical aid that we're on, she had her own room and it was her bed and then my bed next to hers. And then the, the hospital said that we should bring our own stuff with so that we can make it feel more homey. Um, they did have bedding and stuff, but they just said for our own, for the children's own benefit, we should um, bring their bedding with so that they can just feel like they're more at home and more relaxed. And then also lots of stuff to keep them busy because being in the situation that they are, they can't hurt themselves and they can't run around and be all excited. So she was in the oncology, um, so it's cancer and blood disease section. With So you see a lot of children there as well that have got cancer. Um, another thing you're going to prepare yourself for. So, yeah. My husband at the time, he used to have to come, like it was Alexis' dad, he used to have to come and take over from me on weekends so that I could go home and just see Storm at least because otherwise she never saw me. Sometimes he would bring her with to to take over from me just so that she could see her sister as well. Um, and it was not, obviously it's not the perfect thing to do, have to go through, but you know, um, I think it's actually made Storm quite independent as well. And she's a very strong child. So I think that... Yes, it, it's going to affect the other sibling and it's not going to be pleasant that they don't have their one parent around a lot. Um, but it does help them to become more of um, like children that would understand when life gets tough. You know, I can just see with Alexis, with Storm, she she understands when, when life is not going your way. You know, she doesn't expect it to be all rainbows and unicorns and roses and stuff. <laughs> With in, um, Alexis in the beginning of her treatment, she used to have to get platelets on a daily basis. I mean like daily. She also got blood sort of every week, sometimes every second week depending on her blood count. And then due to this, they decided they needed to put a heparin line in quite quickly. 
Now, a hickman line, let me show you her hickman line, looks like this. Um, it's just like rubber, and then it's got a little um, thing over there to stop it from, you know, to stop the bleeding. And then it's got a little lid at the top, I don't know if you can see that, to close the hole. Now what they do with the hickman line is they cut, you, they cut it open here, and then they put it in, and they put it through, and then it comes out over here, and then they close it with a plaster, so every time they need to get it, they just open the plaster, you know. Why they put it over here, in between where her breasts would one day be, is they said that when she one day wears a, a bikini, they don't want it to show, which I thought was quite sweet of them to not want to, you know, let it look bad on her, and or affect the rest of her life. Um, now, if you look here, you'll see that they had, a, when they first did this, it was a bit of a mess because the lady that was doing it, she forgot to close this valve and she opened the little um, lid and it just, blood went everywhere and <laughs> I think I almost passed out because I got such a fright and then she had to quickly close it and then clean everything and start over again. So, like when your child is not, doesn't have platelets and blood, the last thing they need is to lose it, but anyway. So then what they have to do is they have to actually close it. You can see, yeah, it's actually pinching it closed at the moment. They have to close that to be able to open the lid, put on whatever they need to put on, whether they're drawing blood or giving blood or platelets or that, and then open the valve so that it can flow through. Now this was, um, it was a godsend because then at least they didn't have to prick her the whole time, every single day. They could just open up this thing and you know it wasn't a traumatic experience for her to have to go through this every day because it was just they just lift the plaster up and that so that was one good thing that they did that i appreciated because then at least you don't have to hurt her with that stuff every day um what they told me was that they said to me that most children survived aplastic anemia and that the success rate, success rate of the treatment is 98%. So obviously there was no doubt in my mind that she would survive it. I didn't, not once did I think that she would not survive it. She also started getting better, which we were very happy about. And then we moved to the Cape in, in June 2008 because um, of my ex's work. And um, I can say not long after that, she started getting sick again. And by that time, they'd taken the Hickman line out. Now, fortunately, um, she went to the Red Cross Children's Hospital. And there, they don't take the blood like they would usually take blood. Because that would have been very traumatic for her. They actually just pricked their finger. Which, she was, so, she was such a strong little girl. She was always like, okay, you know, she just gave her finger. And she would actually be fascinated by how they would do it. So she was such a strong child. But yeah, luckily that they could take her, her blood count just with pricking her finger, which was great as well. Um, it was just when they had to give the platelets and stuff that they had to actually give a drip. So yeah, so they had to give her a drip every time they needed to give her platelets and or blood or whatever. Um, even though we, I didn't doubt that, I didn't think she would die ever, it was not even on my mind ever, um, she did, in, because in September 2009 she passed away in my arms um, on the way back from my sister-in-law in the car, in the middle of nowhere, which I think I have, I have done a video about this before. Um, I'll actually link it up here if you want to go and have a look when I talk more about that, about loss. Um, they, are, they told me that she passed away because there was an infection hiding in her body and they couldn't, that infection finally got to her. I know that they've been trying to pick up the infection for a while. Every time they did blood tests, they could find that there was an infection, but they couldn't pick up what the infection was. And apparently that is what got her in the end. Um, it doesn't stop you from blaming yourself and thinking that it was you, your, you know, your fault. That she passed away you shouldn't have gone away for the weekend you should have known better you know it's there's so many things that you'll blame yourself for don't it doesn't help it's not a like i say it's not a productive use of your time 
um, because you can't change whatever happened. So it doesn't help to blame yourself and also you're probably not to blame. So just don't do it. Now with, with platelets, um, when her platelets started dropping every week, um, she would start getting blood sores in her mouth. And um, this is something you'll have to prepare yourself for as well. I know even with cancer patients it can happen where the blood sores are quite big in the mouth. And what I used to do is I used to let her rinse it out with Andalex a lot because if they swallow the blood, they start throwing up blood and that will freak you out completely because you'll think that they're bleeding inside and actually it's just the blood that they're swallowing. Because that's what I thought the first time I flipped because she was throwing up blood. But meantime, it was just the blood that she was swallowing from the sores in her mouth. So um, just know this, that if you can, try and get them to rinse it out, but it's going to hurt a bit with Andalex too much. So maybe just find something else that they can, even in the car when you're driving, you know, just try and let, not let them swallow too much blood because it curdles and it's not pleasant for them to throw it up. Like it's not a nice experience. You try, try and make it as least least um, uncomfortable for them as you can. Um, excuse me. Also, the blood spots would get worse, and then the blue marks would also get worse. She could just like brush up against something and she'd get a blue mark. So then I knew the platelets were dropping. I also always had to watch her that she doesn't hurt herself because. Um, yeah, that was a full-time job on its own. She was hyperactive. And like, you can just imagine with a hyperactive child, you, now you have to watch them that they don't hurt themselves. And they are very active, running around and everything. I mean, we found her on the roof once. She had my nerves tap dancing on most days. So, yeah, um, that will become a full-time job if your child is hyperactive and they get this illness. My heart goes out to you because... You will be running around, you will lose a lot of weight actually. <laughs> so, yeah, that's one good thing. Anyway, so um, she wasn't allowed to go to crash obviously because if she hurt herself, she could bleed to death. Um, so, her, I can tell you her biggest wish in the world, her biggest wish was that she could have friends. She would pray for this on a daily basis, like when we pray at night together. You know as a family she would pray for friends that was her prayer and this was another soul gripping experience another thing that you need to prepare yourself for so obviously not being able to go to a school was problematic for her getting friends and she never really did get any because she couldn't like we couldn't take her to school um it was not something you had to also be careful in inviting people over because you don't want them to be too rough as well people you know children don't generally understand um, that you can't do certain things um, after I can tell you with the bone marrow after they, they told me at the um, Red Cross Children's Hospital that they're going to now do the bone marrow transplant um, they're going to be searching for a donor they first did the South African search and they came up empty then they went international and um, they actually found a five out of six match in Canada, but you know she didn't make it to the to the transplant, and I believe that the Lord, the Lord has a reason for that. So at least now I know she's in heaven, and she has lots of friends over there. So that's at least one good thing that came out of that. So <laughs> okay, enough with the heavy, you know, little twilight thing over there. Um, I hope that this info has helped you if your child suffers from this illness um, because I know that it can be, you can get a bit lost in all the information out there. So I hope it's put it in a little bit of an easier to understand package to know sort of what you're going to be going through, what to look at, um, what you need to prepare yourself for. So if you enjoyed the video and it was helpful, helpful to you, please can you give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, if you can please do so by clicking the subscription block below. Um, it shows support for my channel, which I really do appreciate. Also, all of my social media links is in the description block below, including my blog, which is where you will find more content from me. And if you go to my Patreon account at www.patreon.com forward slash Undine Lorenz, you will also find extra content from me and it's also the best place for you to support what I do on this channel and then also what I do on my blog. 
So I hope that you have a lovely day further. Enjoy your moments. Goodbye. Thank you.